The only reason these mountain climbers in this picture are able to stand and kind of hang there is because of friction. Without friction, they would literally just fall right off the face of the cliff. In this video, we'll talk about the four different types of friction, and I'll give you guys lots of real life examples of those so you can identify them in the future. The first type of friction we're gonna talk about is static friction. Static friction acts on objects when they're resting on a surface. So if you had a box that was just sitting on the ground and you had to push it and you had to get it moving, well, the amount of force required to kind of get it going would be you overcoming static friction. Because there's a little bit of friction in between the floor and the box that's just kind of there. And as soon as you get it going, well, then it turns into a different kind of friction, but the force you had to overcome was the static friction between the box and the floor. Same thing happens when you're walking on the ground. Every time you f your foot touches the surface, there's, a, there's some contact there and some friction. That's static friction. And if you go on some ice, you'll notice that that static friction isn't really there anymore because it's really kind of hard to walk on ice because there's no grip. And so static friction deals with objects that are sort of resting together. They're not really moving a whole lot. They're touching. There's no sliding. There's no rolling. It's just objects that are resting on a surface, such as your foot kind of hitting the ground or a box laying on the ground or a table that's kind of sitting on a surface. That's static friction. Now, as an object starts sliding across the surface, it turns from static into sliding friction. Sliding friction is actually weaker than static friction. And you can feel this. If you're pushing a heavy box or something like that, it takes a lot of force to get it going. Like when it's just to overcome static friction, it takes a lot of force. But once you actually get it sliding, then it's easier to move. And that's because sliding friction is a little bit weaker than static friction. Now kind of think about it. Why would that be? Why would static friction be more than sliding friction? Well, the amount of friction depends on how much contact you have. So when you look at static friction versus like sliding, Static friction has lots of contact areas. The object's just sitting there. All the contact is, is there. But then once you kind of start sliding, some of those contact areas break and they start forming new ones as you slide it, but there's just not as many. There's not as much contact when you're sliding. Now, if you stop again, then everything has time to kind of contact again, and then you have to overcome static friction again. But as long as you keep it moving, you'll always have sliding friction, which is easier to overcome than static. And just when you thought friction could get no less, turn to rolling friction. Rolling friction is a force that acts on objects when they're rolling over a surface. Rolling friction is actually much weaker than sliding friction or static friction. It kind of explains why all cars use wheels, and it also explains how this ball bearing works here. A lot of things that have rotating shafts on them that need like to work for a really long time actually have bearings inside of them. And bearing is our ball bearing is made up of lots of little tiny balls and they're inside two wheels. There's an inner wheel and an outer wheel, and there's very little contact area between these balls and the wheels. And so as they spin, they um, there's very little friction because there's very little contact, and there's actually usually in these ball bearings, they're packed with grease or oil or some sort of lubricant to even make them more smooth than they already are. And in terms of wheels, when you look at a wheel, look at the contact area between the wheel and the ground. It's much less than if you were to like slide on a sled. Like imagine if all of our cars were just like sleds. That'd be kind of uh, kind of lame um, because there'd be so much friction. There's a, a lot of friction, a lot of surface between a sled and the ground. But if you have a wheel, there's only this little tiny contact area, which is probably why it's much less. Last but not least, fluid friction. Fluid friction is a friction that acts on objects that are moving through a fluid. It's a friction that acts on objects that are moving through a fluid. If you're a skydiver and you're kind of falling through the air, you're moving through a fluid. You're moving through the air. The air is kind of like flowing past you and you're cutting through it. There's definitely some resistance, some friction there. Same thing in water. When you go swimming and you try to, to swim, um, you have to cut through water. The water is in your way. You kind of have to push your way through it and there's this rubbing between the particles of the water and you. Okay? That's friction. It slows you down. It opposes your motion. You can't just like trudge through water very quickly because it opposes your motion. And so a couple things I want to mention. When it comes to fluid friction, there are three factors that you can kind of change to um, sort of manipulate the amount of fluid friction you get. One of which is size. So if you kind of imagine, first of all, this parachute. If this parachute was bigger, 
Would it go slower? Would it make the skydiver go slower? Or would it make him fall faster? Obviously, it would make him go a lot slower. The bigger the parachute, the more air you're going to catch on the way down and the more friction there's going to be to kind of slow you down. The same thing in the water. If you're a bigger person, you're probably going to catch more water. More water is going to run into you. It's going to oppose your motion more. The second thing is shape. If your shape is more pointy or smooth, such as in like a sports car, you notice that like Chevy Corvettes um, and Vipers and all of them, the nice sports cars, are very smooth and they're very low to the ground. And the reason they're like that is so they can cut through the air better. If you drive a Hummer, that's like awful when it comes to air resistance because it's so big and boxy, it catches like all the air that it's running into. It's literally plowing through the air. But if you take like a Viper or a Corvette, they really cut through the air like a knife, which creates a lot less air resistance. And then finally, last but not least, is speed. The faster you go, the more air resistance or the more fluid friction you will experience. The faster you go, the more fluid friction you are going to experience. And look no for further than to the dog or the person that sticks their head out the window on the highway. <laughs> if you've done this before and you stick your head out, um, it, it pushes against you pretty hard. You know, if you're just kind of strolling through the parking lot, no big deal. You know, your, your head, you just kind of feel a nice little breeze. That's cool. But if you stick your head out and your arm out when you're going like 70 miles an hour, you can feel it. And the reason is because, I mean, there, there's just that much air that you're pushing out of the way. At 70 miles an hour, you're literally plowing billions of air particles out of the way per second. And so the more that's in your way, the more resistance you're going to have, the more fluid friction. And with that, I am finished with this video. You learned all about the four different types of friction, static, sliding, rolling, and fluid. You also learned more than that than just defining. You learned how, they, uh, how strong they are. Static is pretty strong, sliding is a little bit weaker, and rolling is even weaker than that. And fluid is just kind of whatever, uh, whatever, it depends on the scenario, depending on the size, shape, and speed of the object. That's all. Take care.